My name is Tim Crow, and on behalf of the Heart Foundation, I'd like you to welcome you to today's webinar on eating for heart health. There's been a tremendous amount of interest in today's webinar. We've had over a thousand registrants, and at the moment, there's about 300 people online, and I'm sure we'll get more coming in soon. So welcome to you who are joining live, but also for those of you that are joining in uh, at a later time. Uh, if you're interested in tweeting to today's webinar, the hashtag is Heart Healthy Webinar. That's Heart Healthy Webinar, and we'd love you to tweet so we can engage with you later on after the webinar. So the theme is cardiovascular disease, and obviously the, uh, today's webinar is brought to you by the Heart Foundation, and their reason d'etre is to do with heart health. So cardiovascular disease, as you know, has many causes. There are many lifestyle factors, obviously smoking, excess weight, physical inactivity, but of course nutrition. And with nutrition, there are many factors that are related to increasing or decreasing the risk. Now, one of the things about nutrition, though, is that a lot of it has been framed in the past about nutrients. I mean, I trained with a very nutrient focus in my nutrition dietetics training. But now, increasingly, we are using this term called dietary patterns to talk about food and health. So here's a question for you. What do cheese, olive oil, walnuts, bacon, and custard tarts all have in common? Do any of you actually say they all have saturated fat in them? No. And yet, we eat a diversity of foods with a diversity of nutrients in them. So while it's useful at times to be talking about specific nutrients, there is more to food than the nutrients that make them up. So talking about food can be a much more valuable way to talking about health and communicating messages. So while we find be talking about iron if someone has iron deficiency or folic acid if they're planning pregnancy, in major chronic diseases talking about foods and all of the things that make it up, which is much more than the sum of their parts of vitamins, minerals and macronutrients and all the thousands of phytochemicals, um, talking about the food patterns can be a much more useful way in talking about reducing disease risk. So that brings us to today's uh, webinar, which is on dietary patterns. So today we have actually three fantastic speakers who have joined the panel. So our first speaker today uh, will be Beth Mertens from the Heart Foundation. She is an accredited practicing dietitian and also a senior policy advisor in food and nutrition. Beth will talk a bit about the role of cardiovascular disease, the setting the framework for that, but also then about where the Heart Foundation have come from, from a nutrient focus, to being more interested in the role of dietary patterns and how they've gone about doing some research into that. Following from Beth, we'll have Professor Claire Collins. Uh, professor, is, uh, professor Claire Collins is a professor of nutrition and dietetics from the University of Newcastle, and she'll talk more about the actual research that she undertook with her team looking at the role of dietary patterns in heart health. And the final speaker will be Professor Gary Jennings. So Gary is a senior medical officer with the Heart Foundation. And he'll talk about the translation of these dietary patterns into what it means for communicating with patients and clients. The format will be the speakers will together speak for about 40 minutes. At the end, there will be an opportunity for 15 minutes of Q&A. So my role as facilitator will be monitoring your questions and directing them to the panel. So that's enough from me. Let's begin our webinar for today, and over to you, Beth. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. So I'll spend a few minutes setting the scene before we dive into the evidence with Claire. Many joining us today will know the Heart Foundation very well. We're a not-for-profit organisation and a charity. Uh, our mission is to reduce the burden of heart disease in the Australian community, and we do this in a number of ways. That includes funding research, funding and delivering health programs, but also, and importantly for us today, communicating the evidence to our community. So this communication role is a really important one. We communicate the evidence in, in a number of ways and many people joining us today would be quite familiar with those different forms. So they might be guidelines that we provide to doctors and nurses to use in practice. It might be a position paper that a nutrition professional refers to. But communicating the evidence is also the information we provide in our resources on the website uh, for the Australian community. It's the information that we share on social media and it's also the information that we provide to people who call us on our Heart Foundation helpline with questions about heart health and, and heart disease. Um, so these are all different ways that we communicate evidence and in the food and nutrition space we've been communicating evidence for, for well over 50 years. So on the screen now, this is a, a very compact timeline of some of the evidence-based information that we've been releasing over the past 50 years. Now I have to say that a lot of this work is the result of countless hours of expertise and, and time from many experts in the field. So if any of you are listening today, just a very quick but a very big thank you for all the time and, and expertise that you do volunteer to us. 
So while we've had a, a lot of people involved over the past 50 years to review evidence and, and help us communicate it around food and nutrition and heart disease, there's been one thing that hasn't changed over that time. And that's really around recognising that as our knowledge and as the evidence changes and shifts, then so should our recommendations. So there's really three reasons why the Heart Foundation stays involved in the food and nutrition space and communicating evidence to the community and to health professionals. The first one is misinformation. This clipping is from uh, a 1977 edition of the Sun paper and I think we'd be all familiar 40 years later with, with uh, headlines and information like this, uh, as is our usual response as health professionals um, around some of the, um, I guess, unconvincing claims that can be out, of, uh, out there around food and nutrition. But what this really goes to the heart of is as health professionals, we have a really critical role in communicating evidence to the people around us, to our patients, to our clients, to the people that we work with. A lot has changed since uh, this paper, since 1977, in the way that we communicate information and, and social media has really changed the way that we share information. But what really goes to the heart of, of um, the role that we play in communicating is how important our voice is in sharing evidence-based information. And that takes us through to the second reason why we think it's so important to share evidence-based information on food and nutrition. This is a graph here from the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And this graph uh, looks at the risk factors in Australia and what risk factors are contributing to our ill health. Currently, our current eating patterns in Australia are the leading risk factor for ill health. And I think that's a really important thing for us to consider when we're looking at all the evidence and how we're communicating it. So current eating patterns are heavy in discretionary food and drinks in Australia. Uh, for people who might not be familiar with the term discretionary food and drinks, these refer to foods like takeaway foods, chips and biscuits, cakes and pastries, but also sugar sweetened drinks and, and alcohol as well. So from a nutrient perspective, when we look at these discretionary food and drinks, we can see that as a whole food group, they contribute excess energy to our diets, but also the excesses of those nutrients we're trying to control sometimes. So sodium, saturated fat, sugars, refined carbohydrates, trans fat and alcohol. But when we flip that on its head and look at it from a dietary patterns perspective, what we see importantly is that these discretionary food and drinks are taking up place in our diets where core health promoting foods should be. And that takes us through to the third point, which is the remarkable opportunity that there is to improve heart health through health promoting foods and dietary patterns. So the slide that's on your screen at the moment is a, is a quote from a paper that the World Heart Federation put out a couple of years ago. And what they did is they brought together leading nutrition and food researchers and um, they were looking into the evidence around the optimal dietary pattern, but also what we need to do from a systems perspective or a policy perspective or in our general clinical practice to promote this concept of an optimal dietary pattern. If we were to be able to get the, uh, the global community to move towards this, this optimal dietary pattern, then we'd be able to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease by about a third, and that's quite a remarkable thing. So with this, the really important thing I suppose that we, we took away from this, this paper from the World Heart Federation was that it wasn't focusing in on one particular nutrient that needed to change or one particular food group. It was looking at the, the dietary pattern as a whole. Many people who would be listening online at the moment um, would be very familiar with the concept of healthy dietary patterns. Uh, many people would have been working in the space for some time or perhaps as you listen to this webinar today you might realise you've been thinking or practising in this way but not calling it dietary pattern. You may call it something else, moderation, a whole diet approach. But what we've seen over the past five or so years is a concerted shift in some of the publications that we have available, so research papers and also guidelines uh, and general information in the community that's really focusing on dietary patterns as the opportunity to communicate um, healthy eating and food and nutrition advice. And we've got some um, specific examples there from the US Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee who really took a dietary patterns approach when they were reviewing the evidence.
We have our own Australian Dietary Guidelines, which are uh, a global best practice example of food-based dietary guidelines, and they give us the building blocks to build healthy dietary patterns here in Australia. We also have some quite important papers that have been exploring, well, what does that mean for food policy, and how do we bring this all together so that some of the policies or the practices or what we do in our clinical practice day to day when we're talking to patients, how is this contributing to moving people towards a healthy dietary pattern. So with the recognition that evidence and, and guidelines and people working in the space are already thinking in this way and, and the evidence and guidelines around dietary patterns, the Heart Foundation uh, decided to uh, take a closer look at the evidence and what we were looking at in the space of, of dietary patterns is what Professor Claire Collins will be talking to us today about and really, um, I guess, doing a deep dive into some of that evidence and detail. But what we have on screen in just a moment will be the principles for heart healthy eating. And this is really a result of uh, the work that Professor Claire Collins and her team at the University of Newcastle have done in, in reviewing the evidence. It's meant that we as the Heart Foundation have been able to summarise information into a set of heart healthy eating principles. So these five principles, they reflect the evidence on the variety of dietary patterns that are linked to heart health. And I guess from a nutrient perspective, it's important to see that eating in this way will naturally result uh, in, in lower intakes of saturated and trans fat, sodium and free sugars, but also those important nutrients that we, we do know are associated with heart health, uh, whole grains, fibre, unsaturated fats, antioxidants and phytonutrients. So we, when we look at it from a nutrient perspective, we see uh, that, we're, that we're meeting some of those targets. But more importantly, when we look at it from a dietary patterns perspective, what these principles represent is that it's no one particular nutrient and it's no one particular food. It's these five principles together that give us the most opportunity to be clearly and consistently communicating the healthy eating principles to our community. Now, as I said, the, uh, our heart healthy eating principles um, have been informed by the work of uh, Claire Collins and her team at the University of Newcastle. And I think that's probably a good time for me to hand over to Claire to take us through uh, the evidence. Thanks for that, Beth. I'm just going to bring up the slides now for my presentation. And it gives me great pleasure to talk to you this afternoon about the evidence review that we undertook for the Heart Foundation on dietary patterns and cardiovascular disease. I'd like to start firstly by acknowledging my whole team on the next slide. So the co-authors, Associate Professor Tracy Burrows and Dr. Megan Rollo, and then our research assistant, the accredited practicing dietitians, Alicia Leonard, Amy Ashman, Daisy Coyle and then some of our new graduates named there on the slide and we'd like to acknowledge that this was funded by the Heart Foundation. So the evidence review that we undertook and that has a lot of detail in the final report had six objectives. We looked at what is the evidence on dietary patterns for risk of cardiovascular disease and the characteristics of dietary patterns associated with that reduced risk the evidence for dietary patterns and CVD outcomes in those with existing CVD and the characteristics of those patterns. We also looked at the advantages and disadvantages of giving dietary pattern advice versus nutrient advice and the evidence in terms of dietary patterns, translation and cardiovascular outcomes. First up, what do we mean when we talk about primary prevention and secondary prevention? Well, primary prevention is really studies that targeted individuals who had no history of CVD and focusing on the lifestyle changes to prevent that first CVD event. For secondary prevention, we looked at individuals who had existing CVD and studies that aimed at reducing the progression of the disease and preventing CVD event recurrence. We then looked at a third group of studies and these were studies where in the review both primary and secondary studies were included and they'd been summed together and so they couldn't be separated. So once 
that information was detailed. We then converted and assembled all of this information in the form of an NHMRC body of evidence matrix. You can see that there on your screen. And we came up with a graded evidence statement. So if you have a look there on the left, the components that make it up is uh, a rating for the evidence base, the consistency, the clinical impact, the generalizability, and the applicability. And each one of those aspects is graded from excellent down to poor. Now to get a grade A evidence statement, you need to have an excellent evidence base and excellent consistency. The review was extensive and in fact we focused just on uh, looking at systematic reviews. We came up with over 11,000 papers and from that uh, we retrieved some 3,000 systematic reviews. Once we drilled down and looked at the inclusion criteria, there were 33 reviews that could be included in this evidence analysis. There were actually 40 different sets of data that could be used across primary, secondary or combined. And that's why there's 33 studies but 40. Some of those we were able to make statements for primary and secondary even though the, the systematic review included both. And you can see how the breakdown is there on, on your screen. In terms of the characteristics of the dietary patterns, well there was actually quite a number of dietary patterns across these included systematic reviews. If you look at the list there, some of the familiar ones that you would have expected to see, the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet and the vegetarian diet and of course the healthy, prudent diet. But you might not have ever heard of the Tibetan diet, for example, the Tibetan dietary patterns, or maybe less so the Nordic dietary patterns. But each of these were included in the review. And what we've highlighted in this slide is the particular characteristics of those dietary patterns. For example, a healthy, prudent diet, as you might expect, actually has a regular intake of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, fish, low-fat dairy products, poultry, soy, and olive oil. And I'm sure you're familiar with many of the other patterns and we'll come back to look at this again once we drill down into the evidence statements. In terms of data extraction and evaluation of the evidence, we pulled out the characteristics of the studies, the outcome data of the included studies in the review was extracted, the evidence on the dietary pattern and the particular cardiovascular risk factor or outcome was summarised into those evidence statements that I mentioned and then a final overall grading was applied from A, which is a body of evidence that can be trusted to guide practice, through to D, where essentially there's limited or no evidence to guide practice. If we just look at evidence statements B and C, B means that the body of evidence can be trusted in most situations, whereas C means you really need to interpret the evidence with some caution and consideration of whom you may now be trying to apply this evidence for. So here's an example of an evidence statement. Now, there's a lot of words on that page, so we're not going to try and read through all of that. And for each graded evidence statement, there is this level of detail is included in the appendix of the final report that was delivered to the Heart Foundation but I just want to drill down into the two that you can see on the screen there. On the next slide, they're actually in bigger text. They both achieved an evidence grading of A, so can be trusted to guide practice. The first one, in adults older than 18, following a DASH dietary pattern for periods of time from eight to 14 weeks is effective in lowering both systolic and di diastolic blood pressure compared to a usual diet. The second graded evidence statement there was following a DASH dietary pattern is associated with a 20% reduced risk of mortality and incidence of cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, heart failure and stroke in adults 18 years and older for periods of time up to 24 years. So what that means is the longer studies included that intervention actually followed people for 24 years. So if we now look at something that's a little bit easier to look at on screen, 
is this is a summary slide of the dietary patterns and their relationship for primary cardiovascular disease prevention and the evidence grade. And X means there in fact is no dietary pattern that was detected as having evidence for the outcome running across the top there. So if you look at the evidence grading of A, we can see that we found evidence from systematic reviews that was high quality for a relationship between adherence to a dietary pattern dash, a dash dietary pattern, and lower blood pressure, and lower cardiovascular events, and cardiovascular mortality. And that was the two evidence statements I showed, I showed you in the previous slide. For an evidence grade of B, there was evidence for a healthy and prudent diet in association with lower cardiovascular events and mortality. Evidence grading C, evidence for a Mediterranean diet and lower or more optimal plasma lipids, lower glycemic index and glycemic load in association with lower body weight or body composition, and the Mediterranean diet again for fewer cardiovascular events and lower cardiovascular mortality. So in terms of the, the next slide, if we move on, again, I'm not going to read through all of the detail here, but in that previous slide, it actually did give you some of the detailed evidence statements for primary prevention. What you can see now on this slide is the secondary cardiovascular prevention and dietary patterns that they're associated with. And here you'll see there are actually, first thing you notice, there's a lot more X's. And the, it's true, the evidence base is much smaller. There have been much fewer studies on the relationship between dietary patterns and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. The highest evidence graded statement was actually for a portfolio diet in association with a reduction or more optimal plasma lipids. Down in evidence grade C for blood pressure, there was evidence for following a DASH diet, for weight loss or calorie restricted diets, and for weight reduction, there was evidence for weight loss or calorie restricted diets. And the next slide just shows you the level of detail in specifying those evidence statements, which you can find in, again in the full evidence report once that's available at the end of this webinar. There was a number of statements, there were many statements and there were many systematic reviews that have actually pooled the dietary pattern analysis for the relationship between a particular dietary pattern and both primary and secondary outcomes combined. However, there was still no level A evidence statements. So what that means is there's no systematic reviews of high quality randomized control trials that have been pulled together in a systematic review or a meta-analysis. The highest grading was for level B. And if we run across the top of that table, you'll see that in terms of blood pressure, there are a number of, of dietary pattern approaches that are associated with improvements in blood pressure. A vegetarian diet pattern, a DASH diet pattern, a lower carbohydrate diet pattern, and weight loss or calorie restriction, but only for diastolic blood pressure on that one. Evidence grade C for blood pressure was for a Mediterranean diet pattern and Nordic pattern, and for D, weight loss or calorie restricted diet for systolic blood pressure. In terms of plasma lipids, for B graded evidence statements, a DASH diet, a low fat diet, a weight loss or a calorie restricted diet, evidence grade C was for a Mediterranean diet, low glycemic index, high protein or Nordic dietary patterns. When it came to evidence for weight reduction for these dietary patterns, there was a B graded statement for the DASH dietary pattern. And then when we look across in these combined primary and secondary studies for cardiovascular event reduction and mortality reduction, there was a C graded evidence statement for a Mediterranean dietary pattern. And the next few slides, in fact, drill down and detail all of those with information about the duration of the studies included in those reviews 
the periods of time of follow-up and the population for whom that was applicable to. So if we move on to the next slide then, it's worth considering across these dietary patterns then, are they really all distinct dietary patterns or is there in fact some overlap? As I mentioned earlier, you can see on the screen each of the particular dietary patterns that were evaluated in this evidence review. And we've tried to summarise for you what's increased, what's moderate intake and what's a low intake. So the Mediterranean diet in itself was not homogeneous, but in general, across the different versions of Mediterranean dietary pattern, the Mediterranean diet was, in general, a higher intake of fruit, vegetables, whole grains, beans and legumes, nuts and seeds, and olive oil. Moderate intake was red wine, fish, and dairy, and low intakes of concentrated sugars and red meat. The Nordic diet pattern was regular intakes, and by that they're referring to population normal intakes of whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, rapeseed oil, some of you will know that as canola oil, and reduced fat dairy. The Tibetan dietary pattern you need to consider in that that applies to people living in Tibet, but regular intakes for that population of whole grains and cereals, meat, fruit, vegetables and beans. The DASH diet, regular intakes of fruit, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, fish and poultry, reduced fat dairy and foods that are rich in potassium, magnesium and calcium. It has a particular emphasis on low saturated fat intake, low total fat and low sodium intake. And then the portfolio diet, it's actually largely a vegetarian diet pattern. The aim of it was to lower plasma cholesterol and it's particularly low in foods high in saturated fat, but it has high intakes of fruit, vegetables, whole grains, plant sterols, fiber and soy protein and then I'm sure the majority of you are familiar with a vegetarian dietary pattern. So when we actually put into a table how these dietary patterns are the same and how are they different, the cross means that that food component was included. So what stands out there is that 100% of the dietary patterns evaluated recommended more fruit, more vegetables and more whole grains. The next most common recommendation that was shared was for beans and legumes with 85% of those patterns recommending an increase. And if we move to the next slide, you probably didn't notice the small X in the, in the very last row for the, for the uh, sodium column, but the DASH diet in fact was the only dietary approach that specifically recommends a reduction in sodium intake. So this schema here tries to show you, it's not, while it's not true to scale, it just tries to show you how these patterns are the same and how they're different and how they overlap. And that big shared focus on vegetables, fruits and whole grains. So if we move to the next slide and we look at how in fact these dietary patterns are different, that's important because these are sometimes where our messages escape out, out into the wild and the assumption is that these particular foods are recommended across all dietary patterns. So if you look at the Mediterranean diet, for example, it encourages a low to moderate consumption of red wine and a low consumption of refined and concentrated sugars such as honey. The Tibetan dietary pattern encouraged regular consumption of meat and because that's something that's not commonly available in that population, it's that's, that's an important acknowledgement. The DASH dietary pattern encouraged consumption of foods that are high in potassium, magnesium and calcium. So that's your vegetables and fruit, your lean sources of meat and your dairy products. And as I mentioned before, the only dietary pattern to make a specific call to lower foods high in sodium and to lower total sodium intake. The vegetarian dietary pattern is the only one that encourages little to no consumption of meat, although with the portfolio dietary pattern, some of the studies use a vegetarian version of that. But it was the only pattern to specifically encourage, encourage a high fibre intake. 
So in summary, what this evidence review shows is that the majority of dietary patterns examined in this evidence review promoted the consumption of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans and legumes, nuts and seeds, fish and reduced fat dairy products. For primary prevention, the strongest evidence statement related to the DASH diet. It appears to have the strongest evidence base for benefit in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk factors and CVD risk. For secondary prevention, the strongest evidence statement was for the portfolio diet, followed by weight loss, low calorie restricted diets, and the DASH diet. They appear to have the strongest evidence base for benefit for secondary prevention. In terms of the combined, this is the reviews that examined both primary and secondary prevention together. The DASH diet had the most uh, strongest evidence for improvements in blood pressure, uh, blood lipids and body weight. And that's, that's the summary of our evidence report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Now I'll pass on to Gary to, uh, to give us the, the clinician perspective of communicating a lot of this wonderful research actually with patients talking about the foods and the dietary patterns rather than so much the nutrients. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think that evidence base that Claire has presented really does help a lot in terms of what sort of messages we can give, uh, we give people during consultations. Uh, it's a very positive message. It's about what you can eat, not so much about what you can't eat. Uh, although, of course, there's that subtext that if you can avoid salt, sugar, trans fats, of course, that's common to, uh, to all of those uh, healthy diets we talked about. I think the other important message from it is there's a good deal of flexibility in, in the sense that, uh, you know, whilst there was tremendous overlap between the various diets that have been supported by evidence, there are also some... Um, some, some things that were in some, not in others, etc. So that gives you an opportunity to really discuss and, and if you like, negotiate with the person in, in front of you about what's going to suit them because communications about having a transmitter and you've got to get the message clear, um, but it's also about the, the receiver um, and that involves the person's um, uh, state of, of existing knowledge, their culture, their mores, uh, the other influences they're, they're subjected to. And uh, so it, it really requires a, a two-way conversation. It's not enough to just give a download or, or throw a, uh, a brochure at, at someone. I think the other thing that the literature in this area is, is quite strong on is um, it's just as important what is not said during a consultation uh, as what is said. Uh, so if I gave you, a, you know, an obvious example, if someone smokes or, or say is clearly overweight and that's not mentioned during the consultation, uh, people will take that as validation for what they're already doing. So uh, it's important to make sure that, uh, that you don't leave anything out in, in talking to people. The other thing to recognise is that as soon as somebody leaves the, the, the clinic or, or, or the room, they're subject to all sorts of other influences and, and, uh, and many of those uh, are not going to necessarily support what they've, they've just heard and you need to prepare people for that. Um, we know that uh, the media are very, very interested in, in foods. They seem to be uh, more interested in what we can eat more of than what we can eat less of. Uh, and uh, we get a great deal of, of stories about, about something which is good for you one week and, and bad for you the next week. And people will, of course, self-select the information that they want to hear um, and probably not recognise that there are vested interests involved, that there are cabals of people out there on social media pushing a particular pet obsession that they might have. Uh, that, uh, you know, much as we, we wish there were superfoods, there probably aren't. Um, that, uh, you know, portion size can be just as important as what's actually within the food. Uh, and uh, so that we need to prepare people for that. And that might mean communication not just to, um, to the person with the particular um, form of cardiovascular disease that we might be dealing with, but also uh, with their families, with the people who prepare food, the people around them, uh, if you can get that message through and support it. Um, the issue with, the, with my own profession, with the medical profession, is that many doctors are, are very much aware of all those X's in the evidence base. Um, and they're also uh, aware that many times they've told people 
in, often in a sort of somewhat patronising way to go away and, and uh, you know pull their socks up as far as their diet and lifestyles uh, are concerned, and and with no effect, they've come back with um, with the same response. Uh, so that we do need to make sure that we've got that evidence base secure and that, that we have. Uh, as much support as possible for the messages that are being provided. And as I said at the beginning, we're in a very fortunate position that we, I think we've got a very positive message to talk about. We can talk about foods, we can talk about patterns of foods, we can talk about lots of good things that people uh, can eat without necessarily being too restrictive uh, on, on, the, on the other side. The other thing that's important and perhaps not always recognised uh, as far as nu nutrition is concerned is that genes are involved. Uh, there are lots of genes, there's no single one in most people, um, but there's no question that it's harder for some people than, than for others to, uh, to avoid putting on weight or, uh, or uh, 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 you know, uh, develop other, other habits. And so we need to recognise that and, and not be uh, not be kind of punitive in the way that we, um, that we discuss these things with people. And of course nutrition is part of life and there are other things that people can do to support this, particularly physical activity. And once again we don't want to overstate uh, what can be gained by physical activity. People generally won't lose weight, for example, in, a, in you know, the normally recommended uh, walking or moderate exercise programs, but it will certainly uh, support their health in, in a great way. So um, what we've got is a situation where the one-on-one -on -one consultation can be extremely powerful if it's used properly and if there's proper engagement between the people. Uh, that we've got um, a war being fought out in social media land uh, with all sorts of misconceptions and, and uh, fake news to use the, 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 latest, um, the latest terminology uh, and we've got to engage in that too and we've got to keep these messages uh, plausible, simple and evidence based and uh, I think the uh, stance the Heart Foundation is taking in this is providing a very accessible message, something that people can follow uh, and something that I think we can be very consistent about in, uh, in passing on that message to individuals and to the community. Thank you. Great, and uh, thank you very much for that, Gary. Well, that concludes the formal presentation part. Now we have about 15 minutes left for Q&A. So this is your opportunity. I've already got quite a few questions that have come through on screen. But if there's some additional questions you've got, uh, feel free to send them through and I'll try and direct them to the panel. So. Quite a range of questions, which I'll maybe direct to one of you, or perhaps all of you will have a, a particular view. But one of them was actually a, an interesting question where they acknowledged that there's this central core of whole grains, fruits, and vegetables that are common to all the dietary patterns. How do they gel with our dietary guidelines in terms of quantity then? Could that sort of information be fleshed out of the review? Is there certain it, sizes and so on? Uh, that level of detail wasn't easily available in the review, and we need to go back to extract that. But what I think you can say if you look at the current dietary patterns in Australia is that we're way below what, what we need to be consuming for optimal health for both fruit and vegetables. It's only like around half of Australians who are consuming enough fruit and something like 7% who Correct. consume enough fruit mm -hmm. and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So I would say for vegetables, and we've got to remind people that vegetables are salad, is that that's one food group where you can say go for your life, eat as, eat as much as, as you can or as much as you, as much as you choose to. For most people it's at least triple what they eat now. Mm -hmm. I actually think one of the most neglected food groups is whole grains and that's been caught up in this current anti-carb um, message that's out there. So for most people there's a variable amount of whole grains that they could be consuming. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have our love affair with junk food, you could eat the exact six to eight servings per day of whole grains and still maintain a healthy weight. But for most of us, that's the food group that is particularly mm. traded for junk food. So about 30, about 30 yeah. of energy coming from yeah. discussion. Yeah, but I think it goes to yeah. Gary's point that yeah. you can't say, oh, it must be this number of servings of whole grains and then you're not gonna get high lipids or have heart disease. That's the personalization that's really needed. And so in fact, for most Australians, it is about increasing their whole grains, switching the high, highly refined carbs to more whole grains and a bigger diversity yes. of 
types of whole grains. So treating it as a dietary pattern, as a way of eating that you can personalise and individualise to your own preferences and tastes and requirements. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And thinking about the dietary guidelines as those really key building blocks, so the serves, the recommended number of serves, are the, the building blocks that we put together as health professionals uh, and, and suit it to the, the person who's in front of us or the group who's in front of us or the, the audience that we're talking to. But I think that's a really important thing, like Claire's saying, about whole grains getting lost in the noise. Um, but 100% of the dietary patterns that Claire and her team reviewed in that evidence review, um, they all featured vegetables, fruit and whole grains and, and often we're fielding a lot of different questions about really specific foods. The superfoods. The superfoods, <laughs> is this healthy, can yeah. I have this? And if we go back to the basics of, well, are you eating vegetables, fruit and whole grains, that's a, a really important place for us all to start. And I think the other thing about whole grains is you can slot them in painlessly at every meal. You know, rolled oats for breakfast, whole grain bread at lunch, get out the brown rice and have that at dinner time, or one of the ancient grains if you're, if you're into experimenting with new grains, mm -hmm. or even good old fashioned corn, which is, which is a whole grain. Mm -hmm. okay. I guess variety is another characteristic of this, of what we're recommending too. You can't, uh, you can't stick to a single um, sort of line of, of yeah. uh, nutrition and expect to be healthy. Mm. Yes, and a bigger variety mm. is actually an easier way to yeah. promote the intake of both vegetables, fruits, whole grains and all the other groups. Yep. So you know, what I think it means is getting interested in what's in the supermarket mm. again and mm. taking a bit more time to select out the healthy products to expand your variety and try something that you haven't normally tried. Mm. Okay, so probably getting into a, a few surprising details. Um, if I look at the research that comes across my screen over you know, many, many, many years in journals, Mediterranean diet always comes up for benefits for all sorts of conditions. There's a major meta-analysis published recently. So there's a question that's come up or two. Why perhaps was the Mediterranean-style diet or dietary pattern, why was the evidence as stronger as perhaps what you would think? And with the DASH diet was actually quite high. I think it was a grade A for DASH and grade C for med diet. So yeah. what's your feel mm. for the... Yeah, I'm happy to jump that. in and kick off on that one yeah. because that was the biggest surprise to us yeah. undertaking the review because when we uh, started the review, we thought, well, this is going to be easy. It's going to be yeah, all diet. about the Mediterranean yeah. diet. And then we had to think about, well, why is it not coming through strongly? I think one of the reasons is that the DASH diet was created by the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute in the USA as a re recommended or preferred dietary approach for addressing cardiovascular risk as well, as well as other chronic diseases, but particularly for hypertension. And so it has actually been around the longest and been used most experimentally. I was really surprised that there are not more randomised control trials that have used the Mediterranean dietary pattern mm. or the other dietary patterns. So when you look at the breadth, depth and quality of the evidence base, I think that's probably why the DASH diet r rose to the top. Mm -hmm. But um, it shows you, it puts a flag on what areas more research is needed. So if you're an absolute passionate about the Mediterranean diet, then go and put in a grant and get that study <laughs> funded. Yep. But you know, as we said, there are many similarities across all the dietary yes. patterns, this core group of foods that we need to be promoting that, we, that are currently neglected in the Australian diet. I agree. I think it's just to do with the rigour of the studies. I think the other mm -hmm. factor was that the DASH diet was designed for an American population where there was high prevalence uh, at, a, at a time when rates were much higher than they are now, uh, whereas Mediterranean diet studies, a lot of them were done around the Mediterranean, low prevalence um, of, of cardiovascular disease, harder to show a difference. The other point I think you made at the beginning is there are all sorts of Mediterranean diets too. Mm -hmm. We talk mm -hmm. about it and it rolls off the tongue as if it's one thing, but it's lots of things. Uh, but it does share all these food pattern characteristics we've talked about, being yes. healthy, yes. no matter which part of the Mediterranean you look. Yes, and I think in terms of, um, say, more recent of the Mediterranean studies, the PREDIMED study has actually had a lot of attention paid, paid on it, so I think it probably is one that people have heard most recently yes. in terms of dietary patterns, mm. and that DASH diet's actually sitting there in the literature, and so it was actually interesting to see that coming out in the evidence base as being something that's been there right under our noses, essentially. Mm, definitely. Okay. I've got so many questions here to deal with, so I'm going to try and pick <laughs> questions from a range of you know, big issues to smaller ones. This is probably more at a policy level. So the, the results of the review don't seem to be anything new, so to speak, nothing controversial about fruit and vegetables, so to speak. Uh, but how does the Heart Foundation intend to promote this message in a way that's going to be more engaging to people? 
Well, that's a really good question. Thank you for whoever asked that. Uh, absolutely. So this isn't anything uh, completely different and nor would we expect it to be. It's, uh, it's reflecting the evidence that we have out there and that many of us have been across for, for quite some time. So it's, it's not so much a big revolution but it's a, it's a shift and it's an evolution in our messages to recognise that it's not a particular nutrient or a particular food and um, we can get really sidetracked when we, we go down those rabbit holes but recognising that the optimal way to be um, uh, promoting uh, healthy eating for heart health is really this concept of these five eating pr principles. It's looking at the, the whole big picture. What that means from a policy perspective, there's a, there's a great deal of opportunity for us to be uh, promoting uh, dietary patterns. I think at a, at a food policy level, there's a real opportunity and there's been some great work um, going on in, in um, I guess isolated pockets around opportunities to reformulate foods, to label foods, to promote and um, uh, and educate people around foods. But what we're really missing is is an overarching um, uh, nutrition policy that really puts, um, firstly, the opportunity to improve Australia's health uh, through um, through healthier eating patterns um, and positioning that as a dietary patterns approach. That's when you can see all these different types of policies how they can fit in together and and work towards that. What it means from a Heart Foundation perspective, we're definitely um, taking this work and running with it. We just think it's so exciting and such a great opportunity. What it means for, um, like I mentioned before, the different ways that we communicate evidence, uh, this, is, this would definitely be critical to embed in, in our guidelines and our information to health professionals. But like I said before, there's a lot of people already talking and thinking in this way. So it's providing, uh, I guess, um, uh, resources and information uh, that people can access. But it's talking to our community in a positive way about food and nutrition rather than you can't have this and, and this is bad. These are the things that you can do. These are the recipes that will help you uh, achieve dietary patterns which are aligned with where the evidence is. So there's a great deal of opportunity and this is just the starting point Tim. It's a good place to begin. Definitely. Um, a, a very specific question I think everybody wants to know about and that's actually to do with the Mediterranean diet and if there's a recommendation around red wine. Claire. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as we said in the studies on the Mediterranean diet it was the only one that had a recommendation yes. and you might notice that the recommendation was actually for low and moderate and intake of red wine. And can you define low and moderate in um, <laughs> some amounts? Well I guess low would be consistent with um, you know having next to none really <laughs> but moderate is that's consistent with Australian recommendations which is yeah. no more than two standard drinks per day so in Australia we have the universal agreement on harm minimization from alcohol intake and that's the recommendation no more than two per day okay. but it's interesting that it was the only dietary pattern that specifically had has a, has a focus a focus on alcohol so the dash dietary pattern for example which came out so strong in the evidence doesn't particularly doesn't promote or doesn't discourage alcohol at all so I think you know, as much as people would love a recommendation to drink more red wine, that's <laughs> simply that's not there. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't exist in the context of um, this evidence review. Okay. Um, here's, here's a really great question to get you to think about. Um, is there any evidence to suggest which pattern may be the most affordable for those, for the greater spend, for those for lower socioeconomic status? You know, so we have these recommendations, but from a, a, a practical perspective for people from you know, financially difficult, where do you think that the advice could be going? or does it change at all? That, yeah. That's where I think having yeah. the dietary pattern is helpful because yeah. while it's promoting greater intakes of vegetables and fruit, it certainly can promote those that are in season and yeah. those that are the most affordable. And I mean, that would be a great area to have some specific recommendations for affordable eating patterns from the Heart Foundation in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes to Gary's point as well around the variety. There's just an incredible amount of different types of foods available in the supermarket. And, and what this, this dietary patterns approach, as Claire is saying, gives us the opportunity to, to talk about those really key things that people need to, um, to get over the line uh, and then providing um, more cost-effective solutions within that. There's a real opportunity to make that more personalised to the audience that we might be talking to, uh, but also for health professionals on the line in, in yeah. your one-to-one -one consultations and definitely something we're keen to look into as yeah. well in that translation piece because that's think, the most critical yeah. piece. And Beth, I think one of the other positive things is um, many of the patterns actually recommended, I think it was 85%, an increased consumption of legumes mm 
And legumes are one of the cheapest mm. sources of proteins that are out there. Yeah. I mean, you know, bring back good old baked beans. It doesn't matter whether they're dried or, mm. or canned, so long as they're low in sodium. Mm. And um, but what what that talks to then is you to increase your consumption of legumes, you do no, need to know how to prepare them. So people will be looking for the recipes for those. Absolutely. It's the recipes and the food skills as well and I think a really important role that the Heart Foundation uh, can take and, and health professionals more widely, it's, it's joining a lot of the dots because we've got some incredible research out there around food skills and, and um, how to promote healthier behaviours and um, increasing confidence and, and cooking in the kitchen and some great programs that are out there but quite often it's about joining the dots and the health professional, um, often that's a really important role that we play. Uh, we might be the, the to the person of, of um, uh, talking to them about healthy eating but needing to be able to join the dots there. So there's definitely a role that the Heart Foundation can play in providing some of that advice but as health professionals it's a really critical role for us to be able to connect that dots yeah. to, to understand and know what programs are available around us yeah. as well. And I think it's true to say that there are many people, especially those who live in remote Australia, don't have the same access as people yes. who live in the city to quality vegetables and fruit at affordable price. But the other positive thing in moving to a healthier dietary pattern is it means that people will save some money on the discretionary foods. They might be the ones you don't want to give up, mm. but that's where the health gain and there's an opportunity to save some money. So it is really important, as you say, mm. to have mm. those skills around food preparation so you still get to eat great food and you can actually save money at the same time. But it's a really important question and a real challenge, as you say, for rural and remote Australia, for example. Um, I think if you live in the city, if something's plentiful and relatively cheap in the fruit and vegetable line, it's probably in season and probably now that's the time to, uh, to uh, load up on, on that. But uh, uh, there is evidence that even in the Mediterranean diet, there's more of a variety eaten by people of higher socioeconomic groups because they can. Uh, fish, for example, which we recommend is, is relatively expensive, but um, if we can find ways of, um, of, um, of providing that uh, in, a, in a more general sort of sense, we'd be doing some good. Yeah, yeah. so I think that is an area where it would be great to see more mm. resources yeah. around affordability. Mm. Excellent. That's a really good question. Yeah. All right, full fat versus low fat dairy, could your evidence un uncover any differences between them? And that can be a controversial issue to talk about. In the, in the dairy. dietary mm. patterns review, it's not always clear. Yes. Sometimes dietary patterns, particularly for older studies, recommended uh, low fat or skimmed, and sometimes they recommended reduced fats. So I think it's safest to say, without doing a whole evidence analysis just on dairy products, which, which is ob the obvious thing to do, is if you say reduced fat, uh, which includes low fat and skimmed, then you're covering all bases. Um, the main thing to say is those dietary patterns, it, it wasn't including full fat, full fat dairy. Right, okay. Um, I might go to, to Gary on this one. Um, so GPs are sort of a, the gatekeeper for, 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 for medical and even nutrition knowledge for a lot of people. They consider a GP as a first point of call. What can G GPs do more to put food nutrition on their agenda? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's tough because they're they don't have a lot of time with the, with the yeah. um, person uh, that they're dealing with and, uh, and this does require a fairly detailed conversation to go, you know, to get, to get down to the level of which you can make individual recommendations that will fit with what people like and what they can do and what they, uh, what they will accept. And I think the one thing they can do is refer more because uh, there are people, right, many of them in this go. audience, <laughs> who, uh, who actually know about these things and do have the time to deal with it properly. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know it, it is all about um, the quality of the information um, that's given and, and, and how it's received and uh, and uh, I think GPs have to do their bit uh, they're not uh, excused from this uh, by the fact that they can refer to others but uh, there probably could be a bit more of that done. Okay. So yeah, can yeah, I can I just make yeah, a shameless plug for <laughs> for yeah, encouraging GPs to refer people to accredited practicing dietitians. I mean, four years at university, they're ideally placed to do that personalization, sure. which is often the hard part for yep. people in understanding, mm. or if the dietary pattern they want actually falls between a DASH and a Mediterranean diet, an APD can do, can that, do that for you. Mm. What about technology, Claire, in this area? Do you think that can play a role in terms of individualizing? Absolutely, wash person? this space, and mm. we're doing a lot of work in mm. that area, Gary, and. I think what's important is that in the future you'll be able to have your 
intervention at home mm -hmm. and technology will mean that it won't matter if you live in regional or rural Australia, we'll bring it to you and that's very much watch this space. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to take this as a final question and then I'll get into the wrap up. So I'll turn this into a quick little tip from each of you. Um, so what tips, practical tips or recommendations would you have to translate this information to everyday practice? So from each of you, you can give your thoughts. Mm -hmm. oh, I'd say keep it simple. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a simple message and it's a very accessible message. It's one that everyone can understand and it resonates with what, you know, what they were, their grandmother told them or their mother-in-law. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I think if we, as long as once we start overcomplicating nutrition, I think we, we make it uh, less effective in terms of the messages we're trying to provide. Mm. I think my take home would be when communi communicating to the audiences around us, our patients, our clients, our friends and family, it's, it's keeping that big picture in mind uh, and, and recognising that uh, people will always be interested in um, the nutrient or the silver bullet or the superfood, but that's an opportunity to talk about, well, when you look at the basics of healthy eating, it's these five healthy eating principles and those superfoods, those nutrients, they all take care of themselves if first and foremost you're starting with enough vegetables, fruit and whole grains. So my tip for operationalising what you've just said, Beth, would be think about how much or get your client to think about how much do they normally spend on takeaway foods and alcohol and then divide that in half and buy half of it and spend that other half on a bigger variety of vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains and all the other foods that are in the healthy dietary patterns in the report. That's a good message. That's okay. a good one. Nice way to wrap it up. So I'd like to thank Gary, Beth and uh, Claire for your time today. Also, the 400, over 400 of you that have joined in live to today's webinar, uh, taking some time out of your day and actually hearing this live, but also a lot of you now who will be watching this at a, at a later date. Um, you will be emailed not long after the webinar with the, a link to the recording. Uh, all the slides will be available. I could see that quite a few had issue with the slides, but you'll be getting all of the presenter's slides as a resource. In addition to that, there will be the resources produced by the Heart Foundation and, of course, a copy of Claire's review. Um, also, if you have additional questions, and a lot of you, I couldn't uh, get to your questions today, you'll be able to contact Jessie Porter from the Heart Foundation and her email details will be in the email that you were sent. And also you can download your CPD certificate from the resources folder as well online. So that's it for today. Thank you very much for your, for your time. Hopefully you've got some excellent, wonderful practical tips to be talking more about dietary patterns in not just heart, but heart disease, but also a range of other chronic conditions. It has just as much applicability in uh, reducing the risk and also managing these conditions in your clients, but also talking more about food and not so much about nutrients that we have done a bit too much of in the past. So thank you for joining in today.